So the presentation today, it's, um, um, I was asked to, to do something that reflects a little bit more my artistic practice. And uh, I thought of um, starting with um, something about the art of disruption, disrespect, and invasion. Um, what is that? Well, uh, I have been reading Adorno um, recently, rereading Adorno recently. And um, one of the things that have come to my mind, particularly because of the sort of uh, artworks that I do and the kind of interventions and relationships that I put in place, both as an artist and as a creator, what are the changes and how much, if anything at all, the internet has actually helped? And I think that one of the uh, models, the main models within the art scene, um, is unfortunately the corporate model. And, uh, and we will see throughout the presentation of what do I mean by beautiful society. If we can go to the second slide. Um, I was this year, after a while, um, back to the uh, Venice Biennial or the Venice Biennale. And the, the idea was, uh, um, it was to go back and see exactly how much the scene had changed, what was really happening with it, and um, how people were uh, um, responding to one important thing, which is the contemporary crisis, which is both a social and economic crisis. Um, and one of the conversations that we had, it was the fact that the biennial um, or the Venice event, the Venice art event, is called the Biennale by the posh people and the Biennial by the commoners. And already in the language in which one refers to the Venice Biennale or Biennial, um, it is possible to see a different class, a class system that is increasingly um, divided, increasingly fractured, and the divide is becoming larger and larger and larger. And so I looked back at the idea, because we were presenting a series of artworks, and we presented an artwork for the Museum of Contemporary Cuts, which is a museum that is both a curatorial practice, but also an artwork in itself, and presents online and in physical spaces, um, presents a series of events, artists commissioned artworks. At the moment, we have a Mark America with two exhibitions. One is called The Precipitations, and the other one is called The Cloud Banks. Um, so as we started, we decided to create a pavilion for uh, um, the Venice Biennial, but not to call it pavilion, but to call it pavilion with two L's, because it's already a mistake. And I thought that being back to the Venice Biennial or Biennale, for us, it was already an error. Um, and it was an error because uh, we, you know, I feel that increasingly that the majority of the art world does no longer belong. There is a sense of uh, fractures and division that is increased. And so one, of course, one of the things that become important then is to understand if there is a democratic process of access within these, uh, um, these structures, um, which are curatorial, museological, and etc. And so I start to think of uh, the hierarchical system of displayed and predefined aesthetic values within which one has to um, exist and uh, um, comply with. Um, this is the opening of the Museum of Contemporary Cats. It was in 2012, and it was done at the uh, AND Festival in Manchester with the support of the Liverpool Biennial, in this case, um, because it's not as posh as the Venice one. Um, it was a very interesting art project. And for uh, the one in Venice, what we did, it was to actually exist, if we can go into the next, uh, into the next slide, um, it was actually to exist um, virtually um, within, within the space. So when you had, you had all the different sorts of directions, things that people could try to find 
but the experience was one of discovery, one of engagement, which, interestingly enough, people, some people uh, enjoyed, but some others just totally dismissed. Um, so as you can see, the, the word the pavilion is misspelled on, uh, on a purpose. And it's about this idea, because this fear of the Venice Biennial was about the encyclopedic palace. And the idea of a knowledge that is a knowledge that is encyclopedic, it should also include, if you wish, the so-called mistakes, or what would be defined the other of knowledge. Because there is what we could define a correct knowledge, but the correct knowledge is based upon errors and trials. The successful, um, the successful, what can be defined as a successful piece of knowledge is actually determined by a set of circumstances. And by changing those circumstances, then the knowledge itself changes. And what may be correct at one period in time may not actually, we may discover that it is no longer correct later on. If you could go to the next slide, please. So, the encyclopedic palace of what I choose in life. And this is, in the end, is um, um, a curatorial choice, but often it's also an artistic choice, but the artist has the um, bravery, if you wish, to say that the choices are personal. personal. The curator instead, and I work both as an artist and as a curator, has the obligation and the duty to say that the choices are objective. And this year at the Venice Biennial, in order to appear only inclusive, but the ch choosing this theme, the Biennial had decided to do something very simple, which was to wear a mask, a mask behind which all the hierarchical structures of the process of choosing of the corporate existence of the biennial itself disappeared. And, uh, and again, I think never perhaps, like in this year, the greater virtues became perhaps the real stars of, uh, um, of the event. Can we go to the second slide, the other slide? Thank you. So um, this is a system that has several problems. It's a system that uh, goes back to the late uh, um, 19th century, um, and, uh, and it comes back from uh, the Great Exhibition, the idea of exhibiting the Great Exhibition in London, Crystal Palace, um, with the idea of exhibiting all that is there, or as much that is there, that responds to a principle of celebration, if not propaganda, of a state. Italy decided, in some ways, to do this as a sort of propaganda of the arts that Italy was producing at the, at the time. So how has the internet changed, um, and how has it impacted upon um, the Venice Biennial? Um, these are some considerations, particularly from the point of view of the artist. If there is more of a um, democratic participation into the curatorial models, the reality is that there isn't any. Um, I'm not convinced that, that actually there is a widened participation. What there is, there is a set of gates through which all the different nations, all different pavilions decide with very strict rules who belongs and who doesn't. So art becomes a, becomes a game, becomes a game that everybody can play and everyone can play in the internet if you wish or across the web, across the different forms of media. We can talk about you know virtual media as augmented reality interventions and etc. Nevertheless, making a reading of, of art, particularly a moment of crisis like this one, becomes extremely difficult and it's a total different matter entirely, which creates a very 
we have distinction between what is mainstream and belongs to the corporate art world, because today I believe we have to start talking about corporate art world and what instead belongs to the production of content um, that is done by other people. Can we go to the next slide? So um, this is the beautiful life of an ugly society. The beautiful life is that of a pre-selected elite which attends the pavilion of the Biennale and that at each vernissage reassures itself of being the 1% still. Um, I think that there is uh, this very clear definition, and this brings me back to Adorno and to the next step, which is why do we produce art and why do we want to engage within socio-political context? Um, one thing to be observed is that I, I borrowed the beautiful life and the society from uh, um, Adorno. Can we go to the next slide, please? And this is an artwork that was presented in London. It's an intervention in public space. And uh, it's called uh, the Spartan Supporting Adorno. I imagine that the fact that Spartacus was uh, an artist today and what he probably would be doing. And I felt that one of the things that he would be doing, he would be quoting Adorno. And it would be, and this slogan, the repress and who sides with the revolution is, according to the standards of the beautiful life in an ugly society, uncouth and distorted by presenting. Which basically, um, it needs to be translated, or it has to be translated in this way, that although you are the 99%, you cannot complain about it. Because if you complain about it, you are uncivilized. You're the person that misspells things. You're the person that does not belong. You are the wrong Thing. You are the error. That's why I designed it on purpose to misspell the word the pavilion for the Museum of the Brick Hats and for the activities that we were doing at the Venice Biennial. Um, and there is also something else that in contemporary society increasingly anger and discontent are not seen as a part of a process of evolution as a process of necessary confrontation and change, but they are only seen as a process of disruption of that beautiful life that belongs to a very strict number of people. And it's something that should neither be manifested nor discussed, because that beautiful life should not be threatened. Can we go to the next uh, um, slide? This is, again, something that I did in Greece. It's a series of interventions with different posters. And one of the things is, again, the spark of this. And one of the things that came to my mind is relatively simple. And uh, I was sitting here, I was thinking about, you know, large corporate tycoons and etc. etc. And I thought, you know, this is the end of the world, there'll probably be a revolution and you can see, you know, people with pitchforks and flames going towards their houses. And I can see that the scampering, running, trying to make space and running towards, you know, the beach where their submarine is uh, parked. And you know, they run with the servants and everybody is running within the submarine, they close the submarine, and because of the agitation, because of the turmoil, of course I imagined this corporate tycoon to feel unwell and to have to run into the toilet. And run into the toilet, run into this toilet that of course is made of, uh, it's actually encrusted with diamonds. And the problem is, if we're talking about a contemporary society, is it possible that people's lives are, that, let's say, worth more than a diamond-encrusted toilet? Is it possible that somebody could do with a 
gold toilet, a silver one. Um, and the question, the real question is, is a different one, or it's the same, which is how much money is enough money? Um, which is a general question so that most people actually have been asking. Um, how much is enough? And even, I don't know how many of you have been looking in the past few years at a series, it's a TV series, it's called Spartacus. Interesting enough, within the series, at some point, Spartacus becomes a political figure, particularly towards the, the end of the series. And uh, he becomes a political series in some of the comments that he makes uh, towards uh, um, the political system in Rome, what was the political system at the time in Rome, are extremely incendiary and revolutionary. Um, and Spartacism, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, is a, a, a political, um, I cannot even call it a movement, but it's a sort of a political ideology that reemerges from time to time or in time of crisis. So, in order to stick with Adorno, um, I, would, I would like just to say in this slide, let me be uncouth and resentful. Uh, let me be, um, let's say, um, less understanding of the position of the 1% and, uh, and express my resentment for the lack of understanding and the lack of compassion and the lack of fairness and the lack of, of justice and the lack of social justice and economic justice, which are questions that remain totally unanswered. And within these questions that are unanswered, the major question that I have is, uh, should I side with the revolution? And thank you so much. If you go to the last slide, that's about it. I had this in Istanbul as well. They were in Istanbul, they were in Rome, um, they were in Athens, and we'll be having them, some more of them in London and in New York. Um, it's really funny because actually people take pictures with their mobile phone. They just stop and take pictures with their mobile phone. Because one of you know one of the next ones is a, that I'm gonna be having is a Spartacus, where are you? Uh, but the point, uh, the point is, some people engage immediately. Some, you know, they are. You have different ones. You have uh, um, different posters. Some are more articulated, if you wish, so they are more complex. But you'd be surprised. I expected people not to engage with with this one, with the one with the with the dialogue and cross the toilets, and even without the narrative. People that read in Athens and where people from Athens, they happened to be there and to be talking, and they were talking. And there was the the curator in Athens that was uh, and that was listening in Greek, and they were basically just laughing and saying that they would never give up the time of the cross the pilot. So, so that uh, actually people really understand what it is going on. They may not have the full narrative, this idea of these people running away, and etc., etc., but they have the idea that they have summaries. They have the idea that their amounts of money are uh, 
you know, beyond what one single person could imagine to spend even in their lifetime. And so uh, the question of social injustice, actually, I think that becomes, it becomes pretty clear. It becomes pretty clear in the moment in which they actually read the name uh, and start it within it, even though it is, um, it is the title. And um, um, any attempt to make different sorts of comments uh, um, and generally speaking, what has surprised me is that sometimes, even if I'm not there, you find people standing and beginning in conversation about what the poster means and, you know, who has placed it there and if they agree politically, they disagree politically. So from that point of view, actually, I think it becomes very interesting. And it would be a question now, perhaps, to build up some further documentation about the artworks in the sense of how they sit within the city and how people relate, relate to them, and the sort of conversation that they have about, about the posters. Um, I understand that. Um, technically, I have to, um, I have to say this. Um, the posters are ephemeral. Um, strangely enough, for example, I expected them to be ripped off the bat within a couple of days. Instead, actually, they stayed, and the people placed the posters around them. Um, the fact, uh, um, for example, of the identification, I could just put the posters in there and just say, okay, they say just put posters, and it becomes like, oh, who's this person that is putting these uh, posters? Uh, um, as an anonymous entity. Um, I don't think I want to do that, and I don't think I want to do that, not for personal reasons, for fame, etc., etc., because I don't think I will gain anything. Yeah, yeah. So as far, you know, I have I have but, you know, so for me, it's a process of enjoyment. Um, that's, that's not the reason, but the reason behind this is simply to leave a trace, and leave a trace with which people can relate. I did an intervention with a pair of panties in front of the um, Palazzo Venezia in Rome, which is the palace from which the Duce uh, was doing his speeches, okay? So there was a line, a clothing line, there were these panties <laughs> hanging there, so holding the panties, in front of this palace, and etc., taking pictures and whatnot. And what happened while I was taking the picture? It was that people started taking their pictures with their mobile phones. So it was like I was doing the intervention, we were doing the intervention, not for me as an artist, but for other people to take pictures <laughs> to use for their profile. With people <laughs> shouting, genius, and shoving me on the side. <laughs> pushing me on the side in order for them to take a, a great shot from the center. <laughs> um, I have to say that it was just absolutely great. Thing. That was the funniest thing ever. So um, one thing that I find extremely interesting is that there are absolutely two different structures. There is a structure that is a more corporate, and there is a structure in which you do actually engage with people, and you engage with people in the daily life, and you engage with a sense of participation that is different. Um, can the two be reconciled? Can the two be placed together? Um, I don't think so, and I'm not even trying, because I'm perfectly aware that it's like playing on two different levels and two different fields. And uh, I have decided not to reconcile the two and leave the discrepancies there for everybody to see. <laughs>